Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is actually my honor uh, to introduce to you a person who really needs no introduction. Some know him as a computer whisperer or a GIS adept. Some know him as a JavaScript wrangler or a WebGL aficionado. But you probably know him best as Ivan Sanchez Ortega. Thank you so much. <clears throat> It's great to be here in front of G, in front of so many friends, and once again. So hi, I am uh, Ivan Sanchez Ortega. My contact details are over there. And the title of this talk is uh, Four Letter Word. I understand that the title is controversial, since according to the dictionary, it implies that the word is offensive. But why not? Today, I'm not going to talk about genitalia. I am not talking to, I'm not going to talk about sexual intercourse. I am not going to talk about the fluvia. And I'm not going to talk about far-right white supremacists. The word I'm going to talk about is love. Because I've seen it so much even this week. But there's a problem. I have no fucking clue what this word means. In fact, everybody keeps using this word, and I don't think it means what you think it means. The main problem is polysemy. The word has several meanings depending on the context. It depends on the person, the place, the social setting, or a multitude of variables. And if you learn more languages, it only gets worse, as the partial meanings translate differently, suggesting even more translations. One could make an ever-expanding graph of meanings, translation, and euphemisms. I love ice cream, but I didn't love it in the same way that I love my parents, or in the way that I love programming, or in the way I love this conference, or in the way I love intimate friendships. Still, that doesn't prevent me from loving ice cream. It's easy to not be aware that your social upbringing defines your main meaning of the word. It's very common for small girls to learn that love means to care for, and for small boys to learn that love means to enjoy. If you're a hippie who grew up during the 70s, love possibly means disregard current social rules about having sexual relationships. Imagine a nightclub creep flirting. He might as well think that this is an expression of true love, whereas the person on the receiving end would probably not think so. The kinds of love that one is capable of are determined by the kinds of love that one has seen or experienced. What might be the best and most for a person might not be near enough for another. It's not as easy as a linear scale. Because of the, uh, of the polysemy, it is multidimensional. The experiences of each person will go in a different area of this space. This leads to mismatch expectations. When two people want love, they might not want the same kind of love. It creates drama, blame shifting, endless hours of soap operas, divorces. We live in a world of cultural appropriation, propaganda, political doublespeak, advertisements, and astroturfing. It's worrying to see the concept of love to be mercilessly used by privately owned companies to make their image more attractive and make more money. I am not surprised at any backlash or mockery they might suffer when they use or misuse this word. In today's world, I cannot expect to understand another, what another people, what another person means by love. We need better words. We are fortunate. We can go back to the Greek language, which had different words before they fused together into that messy word. There is agape, which is feeling charity, caring, and wishing good for other people. Joy in the well-being of others, of people one is unfamiliar with. Party hosts display agape toward this guest. Teachers display agape when they worry about the learning of their students. Eros is sexual arousal, and it's a word we're familiar with because we know what erotic means. Eros is attraction for beauty and pure pleasure or plain horniness. Eros is the driver for sexual relationships and intimate partnerships. Ludus is the happiness of being entertained, of playing a game, or in a, of engaging in ludic activities. Ludus is the joy of the safe challenge of books and music and movies and sports and stories. Mania is simply admiration liking the virtues of others that one doesn't have. Mania is being a, fan, being a fan of an artist. It's dreaming of becoming somebody else. It's wishing to have somebody. It's wishing to have something one doesn't. Philia, when used as a standalone word, is regard and friendship upon equals. It stands for brotherhood, loyalty, equal respect, liking in others the virtues of the self. Philia is following a common goal. Pragma is convenient. It's liking something not because of the feeling, but because of the utility or value. Pragma is thinking life is going to be easier with this. Storgep 
is the familiarity of the routine and belonging. Everybody feels stored towards their family, their city, their language. Storge is liking, liking something just because it's been there your whole life or long enough to be part of your everyday. These words are a tool set. They allow us to communicate better. But not only that, they allow us to understand us better and to foresee confusion. I urge everyone to choose their words carefully. If you have learned over this week a better kind of love, aim for it. Thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce to you a person who needs no introduction. Some know him as a computer whisperer or a JIS adept. Some know him as a JavaScript wrangler or a WebGL aficionado, but you probably know him best as Ivan Sanchez Ortega. Thank you very much. It's so great to be in FOSFG with so many friends. Hi, I'm Ivan Sanchez Ortega. My contact details are over there. And the title of the talk is Four Letter Word. I understand that the word, that the title is controversial, since according to a dictionary, it implies that the word is offensive. But worry not. Today, I am not going to talk about genitalia. I'm not going to talk about sexual intercourse. I am not going to talk about effluvia. And I'm not going to talk about far right white supremacists. The word I'm going to talk about is free. But there's a problem. Uh, I think it's appropriate since the F in phosphor G stands for free. But there's a problem. I have no fucking clue what this word means. In fact, everybody keeps using this word, and I don't think it means what you think it means. The main problem is polysemy. The word has several meanings depending on the context. It depends on the person, the place, the social setting, or a multitude of variables. And if you learn more languages, it only gets worse, as the partial meanings translate differently, suggesting even more translations. One could make an ever-expanding graph of meanings, translations, and euphemisms. The best kind of beer is free beer. But free beer is not free in the same way that free speech is free, or that an ex-prisoner is free, or in the way a free parking spot is free, or in the way free and open source software for geospatial is free. Still, that doesn't prevent free fear from being the best kind of beer. <laughs> it's easy to not be aware that your social upbringing defines the main meaning of this word. In environments with limited resources, free stuff is good because there would be no other way to obtain it. You have to use this opportunity. In plentiful environments, free things tend to be viewed as lacking, imperfect, unwanted, dirty, or undesired. You could do better than this. <clears throat> If you're a hippie who grew up during the 70s, free possibly means disregard current social rules about capitalistic property. Imagine a person doing their first public Git repository. They might as well think that since anybody can see their code, this is totally free. Other kinds of coders will not think so. The kinds of freedom that one is capable of are determined by the kinds of freedom that, was, that one has seen or experienced. What might be the best and most for a person might not be near enough for another. It's not as simple as a linear scale. Because of the polysemy, it is multidimensional. The experiences of each person will cover a different area of this space. This leads to mismatch expectations. When two people want something free, they might not want the same kind of free. This creates drama, blame shifting, endless hours of flame wars in <laughs> licensing mailing lists, lawsuits. We live in a world of cultural appropriation, propaganda, political doublespeak, advertisements, and ostertorfing. It's worrying to see the concept of free or open to be mercilessly used by privately owned companies to make their image more attractive and make more money. I am not surprised by any backlash or mockery they might suffer due to their use or misuse of this word. Today, I cannot expect another person to understand what I really mean when I say free. We need better words. We are fortunate. We can deconstruct the meaning and see what is the desirable part of being free that we want to convey instead of using a blanket term. Gratis is the lack of monetary. Gratis is the lack of monetary charge. You don't have to pay for it, as in free beer. There may be other strings attached. Something gratis might be the doorway to the costly version or may have other restrictions. If you are given a free puppy, or better said, a gratis puppy, you will have to care for it in the future. 
Something available is something that is not being used, such, uh, such as free time, a free spot, or a free room. There may be other restrictions attached. Using something available might have a monetary cost or be subject to other restrictions. When you have the things that you don't need permission for, such as free speech, the right to free assembly, and other personal rights, this doesn't mean that performing permissionless things is gratis or that one is available for performing permissionless things. When it comes to software, things that you can download and are de facto permissionless, you don't need to ask anybody to provide you with a copy. The ability to deconstruct something and see how it works internally is somewhere between freedom and ownership. That is important in law because a free society depends on individuals being able to inspect how the laws and public contracts are made. Restaurant kitchens open up to allow customers to check how the food is cooked, and the more one can, one can open up hardware such as cars and printers, the more one can be sure that there is no trick here and no full play. In software, there is a troubling trend. Some so-called open source software can be opened up and its source code can inspect it, but it can be costly or not available or might need some specific dependency or permission to be run. It should be obvious that this collides with other words for free. A step farther from the deconstructability is malleability, when one is able not to only see how something works, but also change it. Being able to modify something makes one independent of the maker, free from the risks of a monopoly on the changes. Something being malleable means that one has the freedom to choose who can improve or fix that something, which can be the original maker, one serve, or third party. When others can see, modify, and fix software, it's tempting to offload the maintenance burden. It's like tearing down the walls of your garden in the hopes that it will be maintained as a public park. This is risky because maintenance don't appear out of nowhere. If it can work when there is an already existing eager community of technical users, but more often than not, offloading has been used in a shelfish way to try and reduce maintenance costs. With complex systems, one can get a small part and make it available and malleable, but still needing the other non-available parts of the system. Think about a library to access a service, but no way of running that service. The selfless approach is to ensure the right of digital self-determination of others. Make sure that users have all the pieces needed to run and maintain the system by themselves. The neoliberal current sees a lack of regulations as seen uh, as positive for freedom, but it can detrimental for freedom instead. In theory, the regulation makes software completely free. In practice, the regulation le leads to powerful actors stripping the freedoms away. See, for example, what Apple did to the BSD Unix kernel. It's like Karl Popper's paradox of tolerance. In order to maintain a tolerant society, the society must, must be intolerant of intolerance. In the same vein, for, for, for software to be free in the future, we must not have the freedom to take those freedoms away. That is what the GPL and the Creative Commons Serialite licenses do. This concept has been vilified with bad sounding words such as vital licensing. But it's not about spreading, it's about keeping the restrictions away. These words are a toolset. They allow us to communicate better. But not only that, they allow us to understand better and, and to foresee confusion. I urge everyone to choose their words carefully. And if you have learned over the course of this week a better kind of free, aim for it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ivan.